Hello, I'm Dave Kress, Director of Technical Marketing for Analog Devices. This session will cover the partitioning and architecture of your data acquisition system. In this, we will look at the design choices that you make at the very top level of your system, uh, which will then lead to many of the more detailed cho choices as you go uh, further down. It's wise uh, to spend a little time with this uh, to be sure that you are handling the, the, your signals in, a, in an optimum manner. Our lawyers have asked us to, uh, to tell you that this is copyrighted material, uh, but you are welcome to use this if you ask and if you credit us for the material. Also, we encourage you to use any of the design uh, materials that you see today uh, in any of your designs, and you do not need to uh, credit us for, for that unless, uh, of course, you publish it. What we'll talk about today will be the dilemmas uh, and issues that you run into uh, at the very top level of your system architecture and the partitioning of the signal handling. We'll look at analog versus digital signal processing, which is a really key decision uh, of your overall design. In most cases, you will want to sample and digitize your signal, which is not simple. And we'll look at uh, the beginnings of some of the, uh, the issues in that area. We'll also look at the uh, choices of a couple types of digital systems uh, that you could use to implement your design. The big part of what we will talk about today will be all of the processing functions uh, primarily in the analog domain where we determine uh, where we put gain, how we sample a signal, uh, filtering, multiplexing, other issues in terms of analog signal handling. Now this is a signal chain that shows us how uh, we capture and process uh, signals from the environment. Uh, the external environment, of course, is, uh, is not electronic, certainly isn't digital, uh, and we need to find ways to capture uh, the information from our environment. And we use sensors that provide uh, an electronic equivalent to uh, a physical variable. We'll typically amplify uh, those signals because they're pretty small, run them through a data converter into a digital processor. We then feed uh, back those signals and use them uh, in uh, either analog or digital format for transmission, storage, or uh, modifying our physical environment in some way. And during the presentations today, we will look at all of these uh, uh, systems, uh, a session on sensors, another one on amplifiers, also data converters. Uh, Xilinx and MathWorks are going to give us some uh, analysis of digital processing. So uh, this is an overview, but there's much more detail in uh, the other sessions. In the beginning, of course, uh, sound signals uh, were captured by a, a very simple system. There was a, a sensor, uh, a mechanical driver that, uh, that drove the stylus to record the medium, and then uh, a playback system. Uh, there was no electronics at all in this original system, but it did capture and play back uh, sound. But we weren't happy uh, with the quality uh, or our ability to store or transmit that sound, so uh, we made it a lot more complex. And we added electronics in terms of better microphones, amplifiers, storage media, and so on, uh, that uh, is certainly more complex, but gives us far better quality and much better capability uh, for storing. And you can see that then, of course, the partitioning of the system is quite a bit different, uh, although many of the functions are, uh, are analogous to the original ones. In some cases, the partitioning or architecture decisions are, are made for you uh, if there is an integrated function uh, which uh, can uh, meet your needs uh, quite nicely. Uh, for example, uh, there are data converters embedded in uh, DSP devices or other types of processors. Uh, motion sensors uh, which have in, uh, in embedded A to D converters. That uh, again makes uh, some of these decisions for you. Oftentimes, of course, these, uh, the construction of these devices uh, are optimized uh, to, uh, to make it uh, work quite a bit better. So let's look at some of the dilemmas of partitioning. 
Uh, first, we need to discuss why we bother to digitize a signal at all. Then we'll look at analog versus digital processing in terms of the functions we need to perform, such as filtering, lineariz linearization, detection, uh, or separation of signals. Uh, we'll look at multiplexing because in most of our systems we have more than one signal uh, and uh, depending on the speed and nature of those signals, um, how well they match, uh, we need to combine them in many ways because uh, in the end, in most cases, uh, we will need to process the signals one at a time. Uh, there are also some, uh, some considerations in signal control uh, and how we uh, handle uh, our signals. Now let's start out with the question of why we convert to digital. Why do we bother with that? It's not simple. Analog signals, uh, as we capture them from the environment, are continuous and provide the entire signal. But a digital uh, capture, uh, or the digitizing process, captures only part of the signal, certain points in time, so that we actually lose uh, most of the signal. Why would we do that? Well, of course, uh, digital systems can uh, now can provide uh, much better signal analysis. Uh, the storage uh, is more robust than analog storage. Uh, it's easier to transmit, and we can do it more accurately than with analog transmission. And we can provide a much better filter, which, of course, is part of our uh, signal analysis. So what we'll look at then as we look at sample uh, data systems is that we want to minimize the effect of the sampling process so that the analog signal that we lose in sampling uh, does not affect uh, our overall signal handling. So let's uh, compare analog versus digital design. The advantages of uh, analog design uh, is that it's uh, simpler and quicker in most cases. Uh, we'll run on lower power than uh, adding digital and data converters. And uh, one of my digital friends pointed out that analog systems don't crash and need a reboot. Uh, they don't have a program that drives them, so uh, they just keep cooking. Uh, the disadvantages uh, is that uh, once you're in production, it's very difficult to change and even more difficult to change an analog system if it's been delivered to a customer. More difficult to build out scale uh, to a larger system without adding quite a bit more or simply doubling the size of your design. D the advantages of digital design uh, are that, of course, it's uh, easier to change uh, without having to change hardware. Uh, we can do uh, better filtering, uh, much better signal analysis capability, not sensitive to temperature. Analog uh, de uh, designs do have temperature and time instability. The disadvantages, it usually will take longer. Uh, it's more complex, uh, and the uh, signal-to-noise ratio is determined by the way you go about sampling. So there are some, choice, some, some considerations to ch as uh, you choose between analog and digital. Also, if we're in digital, uh, there are multiple ways to do that. Uh, the two most common in terms of signal handling, as opposed to computation, uh, are field programmable gate arrays, uh, FPGAs, versus digital signal processor, or DSPs. Uh, the FPGA uh, design idea is newer. Uh, some of the pros of that are it can achieve very high parallelism, uh, has a more flexible uh, input-output structure uh, to interface with high-speed analog uh, uh, systems, uh, low initial fixed uh, cost, and you can uh, change it uh, quite easily and quickly. Uh, against FPGAs, uh, they, they tend to run higher power because uh, there's uh, often logic that you don't use, and then for higher volume, uh, they will tend to be higher cost. Uh, DSPs, uh, the pros on those is that they're, in some cases, their programming is simpler. Uh, for uh, a straight uh, process, uh, they provide higher speed. 
Um, against them, of course, is that they are a fixed hardware, uh, not rearrangeable in, in most cases, uh, and tend to have more limited scale for high parallel requirements. So there are some costs, as I mentioned, of digitizing signals. Uh, the first one is that you need to learn sampling theory uh, and, uh, and what's involved uh, in uh, converting your uh, analog signals into digital. The input signal will be compromised. Uh, we will not capture all of the signal, and there's an inherent noise and distortion involved in digitizing. You also need to put a, an analog filter in front of the digitizer um, for reasons we'll get into. And then if you want to put that signal back into the, uh, uh, the, the signal once it's, it's been analyzed, uh, you'll need another data converter and another filter in order uh, to get back to uh, the physical domain. There are many types of sample uh, data systems. Uh, of course, the common ones are analog to digital converters, digital to analog. Um, but other devices uh, also uh, essentially sample a signal, uh, comparators, peak detectors. Um, the, the key function they provide is domain conversion, where you go from analog to digital and back. And they go from continuous time to discrete time, and we need to uh, look at that carefully. Now this is the essence of the sampling process where we have a signal chain of a low-pass filter uh, before the A to D converter. There will be a digital processor and then uh, we go back out to the environment with a DAC and another uh, low-pass filter. The red line uh, in the drawing is our continuous analog system uh, signal whereas the black dots are uh, the points where we digitize the signal. And we, you can see that the digitizing uh, is discrete both in amplitude and also in time. And we'll look at um, how uh, we need to analyze that in both cases. Now, quantization, um, in which we uh, find discrete levels or separate the signal into discrete levels uh, can be done at uh, a wide variety of resolutions uh, up to almost arbitrary levels. Of course the designs get more complex at higher levels of resolution. Um, and, uh, and we can see that uh, if we uh, go to very high resolution, uh, say 20 bits, uh, we are uh, cutting that signal up into uh, one part per million of full scale, which in most cases is more than sufficient. Now let's look at um, how we decide how much resolution we need. For instrumentation, uh, to give you an idea about how to think about this, uh, a typical sensor might have an accuracy of a half a percent or so, which is one part in two, 200. If we digitize that signal to one part in 256 or 8 bits, we will lose information. That's not sufficient uh, for a, a sensor of that accuracy. If we um, then arbitrarily say that we digitize at 10 times the sensor resolution, uh, that would be one part in 2000. And a 12-bit A to D converter provides us one part in 4,096, which in most cases is sufficient for uh, the, the general analog sensor and has been a very popular resolution in industrial uh, and process control design for some time. It does allow uh, discrimination of small changes uh, since uh, found by the sensor. In many cases now, we use a 16-bit for uh, uh, convenience and to be sure we have sufficient resolution. For dynamic signal measurements, uh, for example, in the audio area, we'd like to have better than a 0.1% distortion at 5% of full scale uh, which is better than the mechanical components in the audio string, such as uh, amplifiers or uh, uh, microphones or uh, speakers. That's equivalent to one part in 20,000, 
Uh, 16 bits provides us one part and uh, a little over 65,000. And that, of course, is how the uh, standard uh, for digital audio was determined. And uh, the vast majority of music, of course, is, is recorded and played at 16, uh, with uh, 16 bits of resolution. For very, very fine music uh, and other situations, of course, they've gone to 20 bits and higher. Now let's look at the time domain. We see here three different signals um, of varying frequencies uh, that are sampled with the uh, samples shown as the, uh, the red points along those lines. The, the sample data looks the same in all three cases, uh, but that sample data resembles only the lower frequency of these, si the lowest frequency of these signals. And we can see that we did not sample the two higher frequencies uh, at nearly a fast enough rate in order to capture all of the information. We'll go into this in more detail in the A to D converter section, uh, but the, uh, the theory that goes behind this is the Nyquist sampling theory that says that in order to capture all of uh, the signal, you must sample at at least twice the highest frequency uh, you have in your input signal. Uh, of course, it's usually wiser to, to sample at an even higher rate than that, uh, but at uh, 2x the maximum frequency, uh, you can capture all of the information theoretically. Now also, uh, when we uh, digitize a, uh, a signal, as I mentioned earlier, we need to have uh, a filter in front of the A to D converter, and this needs to be an analog filter. It can't be some form of digital filter. And that is because of uh, the effect called aliasing, which means that signals uh, that are higher frequencies are folded back into the, uh, frequency, into the frequency domain uh, that we're trying uh, to analyze and then produces distortion. Uh, in this drawing, uh, the uh, red uh, slashed area it represents distortion or noise components uh, that will be added to our input signal because of the aliasing effect. And you uh, need to get rid of that by putting in uh, a filter in front of the A to D converter. And you determine uh, that filter uh, by the dynamic range that you want to have, which is uh, noise and distortion free. And again, we'll go into more detail on that in uh, the data converter section. One of the key things that we need to think about uh, is how we go about filtering our signals. That's a very common uh, function which is done in almost all systems. It can be done in either the analog or digital domain. Analog filters uh, are hardware oriented, uh, generally uh, fixed, although uh, you can have switching functions that change them. Digital filtering, a little more complex uh, in software, uh, but typically offer quite a bit more flexibility than analog filters. Now let's look at the purposes. Uh, the most common is noise reduction. Uh, this is typically a, a low-pass filter uh, to knock out the high-frequency noise from the signal we're trying to capture. It's used for discrimination and selection so that we can, say, do channel separation in RF. Uh, find small signals in noise. Signal enhancement, the most common, of course, is in music, uh, where we want to improve the quality of uh, the music we've captured. And how we design the filter, of course, is derived from the nature of the requirement. There are many types of filters. Uh, the analog filters, they're active ones, use op amps uh, with uh, uh, passive components uh, around them to set the filter functions. More common at lower frequencies can be uh, quite precise and complex, but at higher frequencies, the uh, frequency characteristic of the amplifier itself um, will alter the filter function. So it's more often done just with combinations of uh, resistors, capacitors, and inductors uh, to perform uh, the filter functions, normally a little less complex. In the digital area, the two prime types of filters are the IIR, or in infinite impulse response. These uh, 
uh, fell out from uh, analog filter designs, tend to be uh, computationally efficient. Uh, the newer type of design is the FIR, or finite input re impulse response, more complex, uh, but can provide uh, quite a bit more power and flexibility, flexibility versus uh, the IIR design. But again, digital filtering requires digitizing, uh, and there's still going to be an analog anti-alias filter in front of the analog to digital converter. So the entire filtering function uh, requires uh, analysis of, of, of all of these aspects. Now to compare what we can do with analog and digital filters, um, the analog filter uh, is, uh, is not limited uh, in terms of its high frequency. An, an, uh, an active filter would be limited by the frequency uh, of the uh, capability of the amplifier. Uh, they will drift over time and temperature, tend to be simpler. They do not have a limit on dynamic range except uh, perhaps at the, the noise of the amplifier and, uh, and fast throughput. Digital devices or digital filters uh, can provide much more uh, complex capability, uh, but of course at a, at a price of complexity of uh, design. Uh, the dynamic range is limited by the converter in front of the digital filter. Uh, but we'll find that there are a lot of filter functions that can only be done in the digital domain. Uh, in addition to the complexity that we can achieve, this is the key reason why we go to digital filters. They can provide much better capability. Uh, in the left chart, the analog filter, a fairly complex Chebyshev uh, six-pole uh, filter, we can see that provides uh, 60 dB de, uh, attenuation, or nearly 60 dB, at twice the cutoff frequency. But there is a little bit of ripple in the passband. Uh, the digital filter, fairly complex FIR type, uh, has uh, 100 dB of attenuation at twice the cutoff frequency and very, very low uh, ripple in the passband. So right away we can see that the digital filter of comparable complexity provides uh, much better performance uh, than an analog filter. Uh, conceptually this is what it does. We have an input signal with, containing some noise that we'd like to get rid of. Uh, run it through the anti-aliasing filter, uh, A to D converter, a digital low pass filter, and then our output is now uh, the cleaned up signal. Now let's think about the throughput considerations for digital filters. Um, they are limited in terms of the highest frequency that they can achieve because so much digital processing has to go on between each uh, of the samples. Uh, the filters are often composed, uh, depending on structure, uh, on a series of biquads, uh, which is a second order uh, recursive linear filter with two poles and zeros. Um, and a, uh, uh, you'll need to determine how many biquad sections the, that you need, uh, depending on how many poles and zeros that you want. Um, you'd multiply this by the number of instruction cycles, uh, which is six, eight, or 10, um, if you have a pretty efficient design, uh, and then some additional overhead cycles. And if you add all of those up, uh, then let's say that you have, uh, uh, you know, a design with, uh, oh, say, six, eight, or ten biquads so that you can get into, oh, ten or more poles and zeros, and you can see that you have upwards of a hundred instruction cycles uh, that have to go on between each sample. So, roughly speaking, uh, you need to have a digital signal processor or uh, an FPGA that runs at a hundred times uh, your sampling frequency. And uh, so if you uh, are running, say, at uh, uh, an, an audio frequency sampled at 100 kilohertz, your DSP needs to run at 10 megahertz, plus or minus. Of course, this is a very rough calculation, but it gives you an idea of uh, what's required in a digital signal processor for a given application. Now, comparison uh, between the IIR and the FIR filters is that uh, the IIR tend to be more efficient. Uh, 
they have an analog equivalent, which means they can also be unstable because they do work with feedback. And uh, like analog designs, uh, feedback can uh, uh, result in unstable performance. Uh, that also means the, the, they're nonlinear and provide more ringing. The FIR uses a lot more computation cycles, um, but does provide uh, much better uh, performance than the IIR. So again, uh, you'll need to take a look at just exactly what you need from uh, your filtering function to determine which way you go. Now let's move to uh, from filtering to the component known as a sigma delta A to D converter. Uh, it's multi-purpose in that it spans analog and digital and does a few functions for us all at the same time. Uh, it provides filtering at the same time that it does data conversion. Uh, the Sigma Delta A to D converter, uh, which was uh, developed um, in the 80s, uh, was a very important component uh, to, that led to digital uh, audio processing. Um, the A to D converters available at the time of SAR and other types had fairly high levels of distortion whereas the Sigma Delta provided much better noise performance as well as uh, lower distortion and lower cost and is a key component now in uh, digital audio processing and made it all happen. This is a simplified schematic of the Sigma Delta A to D which starts with uh, a summer at the front end that adds the input signal to a feedback signal from uh, a one-bit DAC. Uh, the integrator <coughs> Uh, of course, integrates that uh, summed signal, which is fed then into uh, a simple comparator, which is actually our one-bit A to D converter. There's then uh, a one-bit data stream that drives the DAC in the feedback loop and also is then sent to a digital filter and decimator, and the output of that is uh, our n-bit uh, resolution uh, uh, digital data stream. This would uh, be the uh, <clears throat> output of that one bit data stream and you can see that uh, when the signal is fairly low the uh, output of that data stream is mostly uh, zeros or lows uh, as it transitions through uh, the middle of the signal range. Uh, it uh, goes back and forth from ones and zeros uh, and then at the high level, it's mostly ones or highs. Now, this is a, a fairly uh, low resolution diagram uh, for uh, an actual system. There's, um, um, you know, much uh, higher density of the, uh, of the data stream. But this gives you a concept of what that would uh, look like. Now, this is the, uh, the, the system diagram, uh, which shows uh, how the... Uh, Sigma delta gets rid of noise, and we can see that uh, the analog filter, which has the function 1 over f, that's the integrator, and we find that the output y is composed of the signal term uh, plus uh, the noise term, where q is the quantization noise. Uh, a to d converters inherently have a noise known as quantization noise, but we can see that. Uh, as the frequency goes to zero, that quantization uh, term goes to zero as f approaches zero. So we are providing uh, the, um, the noise reduction at the same time that we are doing the digitizing. Now we show the progression of this where an A to D converter um, at first has a quantization noise uh, and the mathematics say that that uh, noise is Q, where uh, Q is the LSB, divided by the square root of 12. Ideally, uh, an actual A to D converter will have greater noise than that. Now, as we add the digital filter uh, in uh, our sigma delta A to D and decimator, we see that uh, the uh, filter function in red of the digital filter uh, removes uh, some of the noise uh, in the blue area outside uh, the filter function. But then when we add the sigma delta modulator, um, we see that we have pushed out that noise so that there's even less of it uh, 
uh, underneath uh, the filter function. So um, again, our A to D provides uh, uh, sampling, filtering, uh, as well as uh, the data conversion function. So the sigma deltas are very powerful. Uh, they can, uh, by the nature of the modulator, you can change that noise shaping uh, to an even greater extent. Now let's look at the details of how we uh, go about uh, configuring a given data acquisition subsystem. There are many functions we need to consider. Uh, multiplexing, as we will typically have uh, more than one input signal. The gain, where do we put the gain uh, for uh, uh, each of the signals. Uh, sampling, uh, we do need to sample all of the signals and there are some considerations as to whether they need to all be sampled at the same time. Uh, noise reduction and anti-aliasing filter, where we uh, place that, and then some other special considerations for certain types of sensors as well as isolation. Uh, multiplexing uh, needs to be done because in, in most cases uh, the multiple signals uh, within your system uh, will need to uh, um, be reduced down to uh, a, signal, a, a single uh, signal flow and we need to decide where that multiplexing is done. It, it's uh, typically done to reduce system costs so that you can have fewer A to D's or fewer signal processors. But we need to uh, consider some of the issues uh, when we're doing multiplexing, um, primarily in terms of the settling time uh, and other analog accuracy uh, situations which are um, introduced when we add the multiplexers. If we need to sample many signals at the same time, uh, then uh, there are additional considerations. For example, if we want to look at an electrocardiogram and we want to make sure that, it's, um, that all those signals uh, are correlated, they need to all be sampled uh, within a certain period of time. In a um, process control system where we have slowly changing variables such as temperature, uh, this may not be as much of a consideration. Uh, also, audio signals. If we uh, uh, want to preserve uh, a multi-channel uh, audio signal, all of those uh, need to be sampled at the same time. Now let's look at, uh, at the function of uh, sampling and, um, and what that does for us. Uh, if we have an A to D converter uh, of a successive approximation type or other types, uh, it does not do the conversion function all, uh, all at once so that uh, if the signal changes during uh, the digitizing process, this may lead to an error. So we put a sample hold amplifier in front of the A to D that stops the signal during uh, the data conversion process uh, so that we do not induce errors uh, from a change in the signal uh, during conversion. Now, uh, to what level is that important? Well, let's look at um, a device, uh, an A to D converter, which is, say, a 12-bit device. We'll look at that uh, through the, the mathematics here. And, uh, and we have an A to D converter with uh, uh, 100 kilosample uh, per second sample rate, which is a conversion time of about 8 microseconds. And if we, uh, if we go through the uh, analysis and we want to not have an error of more than 1 LSB, that means that the signal can't change more than 1 LSB uh, during the conversion. This then means that the maximum frequency of an input signal can only be 9.7 hertz. If you use a 16-bit A to D converter, uh, the maximum frequency is less than 1 hertz. So you can see that uh, almost all signals need to be put into a sample hold amplifier or some sample hold function uh, prior to digitizing. Many A to D converters now have this digi the sampling function built into them, uh, unlike uh, previous designs that had separate sample hold amplifiers. Now, let's look at the various levels of multiplexing that can happen for uh, fairly lo low speed signals, 
the AD7298 uh, has an input multiplexer with a track hold amplifier, uh, and this uh, has sufficient speed uh, for handling process control uh, type signals. But if we want to uh, sample uh, signals such as the uh, electrocardiogram, then uh, one way to do that is to have a multi-channel track hold. The AD7606 has uh, eight track hold amplifiers built in. And when we want to sample the signals, uh, a signal um, uh, hold function is, uh, is applied to each of the track hold amplifiers. They each stop uh, their input signal. And then the A to D converter cycles through all the track hold amplifiers and, uh, and digitizes them uh, in sequence. Then the signals are recaptured and held again for another conversion cycle. Uh, this is good enough for relatively low frequency signals uh, if you have an A to D converter that can uh, go through fast enough uh, to meet the Nyquist criteria for all of those signals. Now, if you have very high speed signals, you may very well, uh, it, it may happen that uh, simultaneous sampling with the amplifiers will not be fast enough. In that case, you need multiple A to D converters. And we show here our AD9643, which has two parallel 14-bit A to D converters. And in order to simultaneously sample, each A to D converter is started at the same time to provide the sampling function. The only drawback to this type of thing is that um, the A to D converter uh, distortion characteristics or linearity may not be exactly matched. So you will typically need to go to somewhat higher resolution uh, converters. In the previous designs, one A to D converter is used to um, uh, digitize all of the signals, so therefore uh, that mismatch is not uh, a problem. One consideration with A to D converters is that they need uh, a very low impedance driver because the A to D converters generate switching transients that can uh, corrupt the signal uh, if the uh, amplifier in front of the A to D cannot suppress them. But we need to decide where to put the anti-aliasing filter with respect to that amplifier uh, to uh, get optimum signal uh, performance. Uh, if we put the amplifier after the low-pass filter, then the noise of the amplifier will also be captured uh, by the A to D converter. If we put the amplifier before uh, the um, anti-aliasing filter, that filter can reduce the amplifier noise, but it must be a, a sufficiently low impedance uh, so that uh, the switching transients of the A to D converter uh, do not uh, generate additional noise. So now the next function we need to think about is the gain uh, of our system. Uh, and uh, w one consideration uh, has to do with the design of very high resolution systems. Uh, one uh, way that that was designed uh, was to use a programmable gain, am gain amplifier uh, with a medium resolution A to D converter and uh, then the uh, PGA extends the range of that A to D, um, giving the effect of much higher uh, resolution. It allows us to get very fine resolution, um, although there are uh, issues in that unless the gain ranges are exactly matched, that can induce some distortion uh, if an input signal uh, traverses a very wide range. Uh, because of the uh, nonlinearity. Uh, this is not as popular as it once was because we have available uh, higher and higher resolution A to D converters, but there are certain areas uh, for very high resolution where it uh, can be useful. And this would show uh, the use of a programmable gain amplifier uh, in uh, a data acquisition subsystem when we have multiple input signals. In a process control system, um, you can have signals of a, a very wide range uh, from different types of sensors, and you'd want to change the gain um, 
for each of those sensors uh, so that the uh, A to D converter is using uh, all of its available resolution uh, so that you're not losing signal uh, with a very low level signal that uses only uh, part of the range of the A to D converter. And then you need to uh, set up the A to D or the PGA according to what you know is the signal uh, range of each sensor. Now another uh, issue in terms of uh, design of sy uh, systems has to do with uh, the certain sensors that require additional analog processing. Uh, one of these of course is the thermocouple uh, which requires uh, cold junction compensation. Uh, you have very very wide dynamic range devices such as photodiodes uh, which may require signal compression. Uh, some sensors uh, vary from unit to unit um, <clears throat> so that you need to retune uh, for each one. Uh, you have calibration, uh, sensor replacement, uh, all of these may require some special uh, analog processing. But more and more this is being done in the digital area as you store uh, adjustment coefficients uh, in the software and then uh, in, especially in high voltage systems, we may, may need to add isolation. The thermocouple uh, requires cold junction compensation in that it is a device uh, composed of two different metals uh, connected together that uh, provide a, a small voltage that changes with temperature. Uh, it's a very useful type of sensor, certainly the most popular uh, type of uh, temperature sensor because of its wide temperature capability. But the problem with the thermocouple is that when you connect it uh, into your system, there are additional thermocouples uh, induced because you go from um, one type of metal to another, say copper, uh, in the uh, system. Those also are going to provide um, a signal depending on uh, temperature changes uh, at, the, uh, at the central system. So we need to provide cold junction compensation uh, in order to, uh, to compensate for that. And this has typically been done with a variety of analog designs. Uh, we'll go into that in, in more detail in our low level signal acquisition session. session. But here's another uh, partitioning uh, choice that's now available to you in which uh, you can use a device such as our AD 7320, uh, which is uh, a uh, temperature sensor with an A to D converter built in with uh, one quarter degree C accuracy. And that means that if you put this device near the cold junction at the uh, input to the system, you can then use that digital si signal as a compensation as opposed to a perhaps more complex uh, analog um, cold junction compensation technique. Uh, there are many ways to partition systems uh, and uh, as time goes on digital uh, ideas uh, do become uh, more available. Now the other um, consideration we have with uh, our signals is that many of them are very wide dynamic range. Uh, a radio antenna of course uh, is capturing broadcast signals uh, Depending on the distance from uh, that signal, it can be uh, fairly large or extremely small. Uh, photomultipliers um, and photodiodes uh, are used over very, very wide signal range, depending on light intensity. Uh, and uh, in most cases, uh, these uh, signals need to be uh, compressed to a much smaller signal range uh, so that they can be handled more easily. Um, this has been done with logarithmic amplifiers uh, which can uh, process uh, compressed signals over 120 dB or a million to one or more uh, from, from say uh, you know one microvolt to one volt and then that signal range is, is compressed to a more usable one to ten volts. Uh, accuracy is typically in the range of 0.1 uh, to 0.5 dB or 1 uh, to 5 percent. It can be done in a, uh, in a digital fashion by using a very high resolution A to D converter and we'll show a circuit for that. The digital compression of course cannot achieve the uh, very high frequencies which logarithmic amplifiers can.
Uh, this would be the log amplifier transfer function where on the uh, x-axis uh, we show uh, input on a, a log scale um, from in this case 10, 1, 10, and 100 and then that's compressed to a linear scale uh, and we show 0, 1, and 2. The accuracy of a device such as uh, an AD8307 is able to achieve uh, half a dB out to uh, 500 megahertz. Now, it's a fairly simple device um, and uh, for handling RF power measurements. Now let's look at a design where uh, we're using an oversampled uh, SAR ADC with a programmable gain amplifier um, and achieving uh, over 125 dB of dynamic range. Uh, and, and this works quite well, but we can see that the sampling rate of this is only about two and a half megasamples per second versus uh, the logarithmic amplifier that can run up into the uh, 100 megahertz range. And uh, with this particular design, we have uh, the AD8253, which is a programmable gain amplifier, uh, which can switch from uh, gains actually of 1, 10, 100, or 1,000, and, uh, and these gains are very uh, precisely uh, set. Uh, the uh, amplifier uh, uh, goes uh, through uh, a buffer and then into the AD7985 A to D converter. And the FPGA then determines the range and through A1 feeds back to change uh, the gain of the input amplifier and typically will change it at one quarter and three quarter full scale uh, to, uh, to maximize uh, the range of the, uh, the amplifier and A to D converter. And uh, this is in our uh, circuit note or circuit from the lab CN260. Uh, Isolation, uh, which is uh, used to galvanically uh, separate our systems so that there's uh, uh, no uh, wire connection between different parts of the system, uh, but we're still able to transmit the signal. These are used uh, to uh, uh, provide safety in patient monitoring, uh, typically uh, in high voltage systems or in process, uh, complex process control, you want to get rid of high comm mode noise. This is typically now done at the digital level uh, as we, uh, we can transfer the digital signals. Uh, it can be done more accurately than analog isolation. Uh, we need to think about the consideration of providing power. This is an isolation uh, design which is used to um, capture the current signal uh, from a very high voltage load. The AD8212 is biased up on the resistor string so that it can capture a very small signal directly uh, from the 500 volt source. Um, this is high side current sensing. Um, which typically works better than uh, the low side current sensing. Uh, the signal from the AD8212 is uh, um, buffered with a high voltage transistor and then goes through uh, the A to D conversion process in the AD7171. Uh, we have an isolation uh, device, uh, the ADUM5402, which isolates that entire high voltage system uh, section of the uh, system from the rest of the system in case there's a failure it does not cause a uh, failure of the entire system. We also have uh, some newer devices such as the AD629 that have uh, precision attenuators built onto the device uh, that can achieve uh, this same function without the resistor string shown in the previous one uh, the AD629 can go up to handle up to 270 volt of common mode range uh, and then we have uh, uh, buffering and the A to D converter followed by the isolator. Uh, we also can still do analog to analog isolation uh, and uh, our circuit note 185 uh, shows how uh, that can be done in a very clever way. Now we can also think about reverse partitioning uh, where we put some of the uh, 
digital functions or control functions out at the analog uh, design uh, point so that we can offload the main processor and reduce uh, the programming load. Uh, automatic gain control is, is one of those and, uh, and also power control. Our AD5755, uh, which is a 16-bit 4 to 20 milliamp uh, DAC for industrial signals, uh, can sense its own uh, power level and, uh, and make adjustments to, uh, to reduce the amount of power needed. Uh, and also has additional on-chip diagnostics for calibration. Now we'd like to, uh, to show you um, a uh, circuit note, our CN251, uh, which has everything we've discussed in partitioning. Uh, multiplexing, buffering, uh, instrumentation amplifier, filtering, uh, and a funnel amplifier that uh, I'll cover in, in a second here. Uh, along with programmable gain uh, and noise shaping. So uh, this includes all of the functions that you, you might want uh, for a complete system. You might very well not use all of them. We see uh, an input multiplexer uh, and then a differential uh, buffer input amplifier. And the AD8475 uh, is able to take uh, fairly high voltage uh, input levels of uh, 0 to 10 volts uh, and then with a precision attenuator reduce those uh, to say 0 to 2.5 volts that might be used on a 5 volt uh, A to D converter. We also see that the AD7192 has additional multiplexing capability and programmable gain amplifier for wide dynamic range. And we'll show this uh, in our uh, demo area as well. So what we've uh, covered today then uh, are the dilemmas of system architecture and partitioning, uh, how we can decide between using analog and digital signal processing, uh, the issues of sampling and digitizing uh, our analog signals, a quick look at uh, a couple of uh, alternatives for uh, digital designs, went into some detail on the analysis of how we go about filtering and ways to do that, and then all of the processing functions uh, that are used in a complete data acquisition system. Thank you.